my pleasure to introduce our Tuolumne Valley Water District Chief Engineer, Mark Newson. Mark graduated in engineering for or from Oregon State University, and he's still a beaver believer, 100%. He's been with Tuolumne Valley Water District for five years, and Mark's been deeply involved in our water source decision from, from, this, uh, from 2007 when we first started that, that decision, and he's well qualified to present our plans. So please welcome Mark Newton. Thank you, Commissioner McWilliams, John, thank you everybody for being here. It's a great opportunity to be able to summarize what TVWD's been up to, and particularly to talk about our reliable drinking water future and where we might get water supply in the future. Um, I, I want to take just a second to point out that we have a couple of TBWD commissioners in the audience. In addition to Commissioner McWilliams, we have Board President Dick Schmidt in the back of the room. And Commissioner Jim Doan in the front of the room. So we have you bookend at this point. And, and, and the reason they're here, it's a reflection of just how important this issue is to TBWD and to the community. And so uh, we're here to really field your questions and talk about this, but if you have other questions afterwards, you want to follow up with uh, our commissioners individually, I'm sure they're happy to hear from you. So that's what we are going to do today. So, <clears throat> pardon me, it's, it's really easy to take water for granted. Um, we just go to the tap, you turn it on, it comes out, and it's just that easy. But the fact of the matter is, there's obviously a lot that goes into making sure that the water is abundant, that it's safe, that it's reliable. And that's what we do every day. But we need to be looking forward in terms of how we do that in the future. And so we, we talk in terms of water supply because you go to the tap. But the fact of the matter is, water serves our community in a lot of different ways. It's water for public health in terms of drinking, but it's also water for public health in terms of flushing, right? That's a critical part of what we provide water for. It's also water for public safety in terms of fighting fires. It's that same water supply that goes into providing uh, the safety and security of our community through firefighting. And last, last but not least, it's, it's essential in terms of having water to contribute towards a, a vital and robust economy of our community. And so we're really fortunate in the the Beaverton Hillsboro area to have large industries that rely heavily on water, and we're going to talk more about that in a minute. But we need to be able to provide their water supply as well, since those organizations do a lot to contribute towards the jobs and the overall economic vitality of our community. So we want to talk a little bit about TBWD just to begin with, uh, make sure you're familiar with us. We serve about 200,000 people. We serve mostly uh, large areas of unincorporated Washington County, but we also serve portions of the city of Beaverton, portions of the city of Hillsboro, and portions of the city of Tigard. So we're really kind of covering the real estate, covering the waterfront, if you will, in terms of this whole section of the Tualatin Valley. Um, we were originally formed as Tualatin Valley back in, Tualatin Valley Water District back in 91. That was the merger of the Wolf Creek Highway Water District, and the Metzger Water District. The district covers about 45 square miles in western Washington County. Um, it, uh, we have 700, and I had to refer to my notes for the numbers, 739 miles of pipe, um, which is a lot of pipe when you think about it, 739 miles. 24 covered reservoirs, a dozen pump stations, a hundred different control valves. There's a lot of hardware that makes this whole thing happen. We provide on average about 22 million gallons a day of water. Um, last year, our peak day was just about 40 million gallons a day. So a lot of water goes through those 730 miles of pipe. As I mentioned before, we also serve large industrial customers. So if you take a look at the TBWD customer base, about 90% of the number of customers that we have are residential customers. They, you know, they are the people that are, we're serving the homes for the people that work in the factories. 
But the fact of the matter is, about a little over three quarters of our water goes to those residential customers, and um, nearly a third of our water supply goes to the few industrial customers that are listed here, Intel, Nike, St. Providence Hospital, uh, Research, Maxim, Tektronics, Beaverton School District. So there's, there's a few large customers that represent a significant portion of the overall TBWD demand. Obviously, those folks are critical in terms of maintaining that economic vitality of our community, and so we want to make sure that we're addressing their needs as well. So as we've looked through what, what's required to meet our customers' needs, both the residential and industrial customers, we've done several different supply plans based on um, population forecasts and job forecasts from Metro and others, University of Portland State University. And, and basically, I, I talked earlier about that we had a peak day of about 40 million gallons a day last year. So that's the number that you see on the left, is about 40 million gallons a day. And, and our projections show that by 2050, we'll need nearly twice that much, about 75 million gallons a day by 2050, to be able to meet those peak day demands. The population forecasts show that we'll be adding about 82,000 residents. Those are new residents to the district service area by 2042. Those existing demands coupled with the future growth in the region result in a need to add additional capacity. The fact of the matter is our existing capacity, which is about a little over 50 million gallons a day, doesn't meet that projected future demand. So we need to be able to add capacity, that additional water has to come from somewhere, and that's really what we're talking about. Right now we get our water from really two different primary sources. The first primary source is the uh, city of Portland. Um, we get about 60% of our water supply from the Portland Water Bureau under a wholesale contract that we've had with Portland. Actually, the contract's been in place since about 2006. So we purchased that water. We just were, we're essentially the equivalent of a renter. We pay every month to be able to purchase that water under that long-term contract. In addition, we are an owner, we are a joint owner of the Joint Water Commission's supply. Um, we also own a portion of the Barney Reservoir on the Trask system. So we get about a third of our water uh, from the Tr Trask Tualatin system, that Joint Water Commission system that includes not just TVWD, but also the cities of Beaverton, Hillsborough, and Forest Grove. And then last but not least, we have an aquifer storage and recovery well on Cooper Mountain. The ASR, or aquifer storage and recovery, is a technology where you take water during the winter, treated finished water, when, it, when the water supply is abundant, and you run it down a well and you store it in the aquifer. And then during the summer, when the water's you know, less abundant and, and the demands are up, then we pump that well and pump the water out of the system into the distribution system. So it's, it's essentially like a very large storage reservoir that we can draw on when the demands are up. Right now we have pardon me, a capacity of about 3 million gallons a day from aquifer storage and recovery. And so it's not a big part of our supply, but it's an important part just the same. The whole idea is having these three sources of supply provides redundancy or resilience in terms of having multiple sources of supply. That's been a policy direction from the TVWD board for years now, and it's something that we obviously want to continue into the future. We're also really fortunate because not only is the reliability a key part of it, but affordability is essential as well. And so many years ago, nearly 10 years ago, the TVWD board identified that someday we would need additional supply and began slowly raising rates very incrementally, recognizing there would be a need for future investment in a supply system. And so what you see here are TBWD's rates compared to other rates in the region, and we're just a little bit below the midpoint. And so these are, this is the typical water bill um, that, that an average consumer would pay and we've broken it down on a monthly basis just to keep it consistent with all of the different systems since some systems build 
every three months, other systems bill every two months. So this is the typical monthly water bill. But the point is that recognizing there would be a need for future investment in water supply, the actions that the TBWD board have taken over the years have helped slowly ratchet those rates up so that when we begin to make big investments in future sources of supplies, the rate increase isn't going to be as dramatic as it would have been otherwise. And so over time, it's sort of minimized the rate burden associated with that future source of supply. We keep talking about future sources of supply, but obviously the first essential source becomes conservation. We've been committed to conservation for many years now. The TBWD organization as a whole has one of the most aggressive conservation programs of all of the programs in the region. And so we've listed here all of the many activities, 84,000 water conservation kits uh, in the last seven years, uh, done 255 site assessments where we literally have people go on site and will tour the the production facility or uh, other business to be able to identify opportunities to save water. We, we have the most aggressive rebate program in the region and this is basically if you buy a new water efficient toilet, we will actually pay you money back to be able to put that toilet into the system to be able to save water. We're one of the few businesses, our, our CEO Greg DiLoretto likes to point out, we're one of the few businesses where we actually pay you to use less of our product. Because of those aggressive conservation measures, we've been able to actually reduce the per capita water demand, the amount that each individual person uses by about 16% during that last, the last seven years. So pretty dramatic reduction over time as a result of these conservation measures. The key message is that although Water conservation is important. Unfortunately, we can't conserve our way out of those additional demands. So we talked about saving 16% of the demand over the seven year period, but we also identified that we need to add somewhere around 50% uh, of our capacity, nearly double, 100%, nearly double our capacity over the next 40 years. And so we need to continue to do the good work that we've done on conservation but we ne still need to continue the planning for a future source of supply. So part of that planning is summarized on this slide. Um, I'll just kind of quickly run through the four options that we've taken a close look at over the last couple of years. We've done this work largely in direct coordination with the city of Hillsborough, who recognized a couple of years ago that they too needed to be considering alternative sources of supply. The other piece that I want to explain here is that actually in 2007, the TBWD board made a very bold decision and at that time said that the future source of supply for TBWD as well as the region would be uh, the Tualatin Basin Water Supply Project, adding water to Hag Lake, basically. Since that time, we've learned a lot about that project and and several months ago, the TBWD board acknowledged that we might want to reconsider that decision. Make sure that either that's the right direction, or if not, what the future direction would be. So that's what we're going to talk, spend a little time talking about. So we've considered Hag Lake, Tualatin Basin Water Supply Project, as one of our options. We've also considered what we call the Northern Groundwater Option. This would be a series of collector wells near Scapoose that would pump water into the TBWD system over the Cornelius Pass. We'll talk more about that. Third option would be the Mid Willamette, which is the supply for the city of Wilsonville right now. This would be tapping into that existing source of supply, expanding the treatment plant, and bringing the water into the TBWD service area. And the fourth option would be to continue to buy more water from the city of Portland under that existing contract and ultimately actually expand the pipelines that bring, increase the capacity of the pipelines that bring that supply into TBWD. Obviously, this is a very important decision and the board wanted to make sure that they were fully informed in terms of these options. And so we spent a lot of time as a board working through how would we evaluate these options. Certainly the cost was going to be 
front and center in terms of uh, being a key evaluation criteria, but there were other non-financial factors that would have to be considered as well. So we've listed all of these factors, but they include things like finished water quality, things like can, we, can it be right-sized? And that was important in terms of scalable. If we were going to have to invest a lot of money, but it was going to go unused for a long period of time, that might not be a very effective investment decision as opposed to a, a scalable solution. It, there was a key goal to provide redundancy. Reliability of the water supply is, is a critical concern. It continues to drive the objectives of TBWD. And if we had the opportunity to improve that reliability by adding to the redundancy of the supply system, we wanted to consider that as an important option. And last but not least, the one I'll mention is sustainability. Um, TBWD is a leader in sustainability, and one of the key factors that we wanted to think about is how sustainable is this particular solution. Some options require a fair amount of energy, so that Northern Groundwater will talk about it, but the fact of the matter is it requires a lot of energy to pump the water out of the ground, treat the water, then pump it over to the Cornelius Pass. In that respect, it's not a particularly sustainable solution. So these were all the factors. We looked at the options. We went through a rigorous evaluation procedure, scored all of the options, and, and that will all get folded into the decision-making process. So I'll spend a few minutes just drilling into each of these options, no pun intended, in terms of explaining the details about each option. So the first is uh, Hague Lake. It goes by several names. Of course, there's Hague Lake, there's the Scoggins Dam, and from a water supply standpoint, we talk about the Tualatin Basin Water Supply Project. That was originally conceived several years ago with the objective of raising the level of the dam by about 40 feet it would inundate a bunch of additional area around uh, Hag Lake. Historically, it's proven to have very good water quality. That's the water that we're drinking today is from that system. Um, it's proven to be very reliable. There's an abundant source of supply, and it would be configured with, with both the dam rays and some additional pumping features to even enhance the reliability of that supply. But there's some significant challenges, not the least of which you've undoubtedly heard about in terms of seismic concerns associated with that dam. The dam is actually owned by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, um, who about five years ago began studying the dam because of concerns about the subduction zone earthquake, the large fault that lies off of the Oregon coast that could cause a magnitude 9 earthquake. Unfortunately, this dam was designed to never withstand that kind of event and is actually constructed in a way that makes it rather vulnerable to failure in a large shaking event. So we've been working with and following what Reclamation's work has been to be able to understand is it possible to fix the dam and what would those costs be? To what extent would the Bureau of Reclamation be engaged in helping pay for some of those costs? And you'll be hearing more about that in the media in the coming weeks. But one of the other challenges we identified in studying the project was it turns out that there is a threatened butterfly and an endangered uh, plant in the area that would be inundated by the dam rays. And so we now have both a threatened and an endangered species that are truly listed under the Endangered Species Act that would have to be mitigated if we were to raise the dam level adds a whole new dimension of challenges to that particular project. And it's not clear, Reclamation hasn't been real forthcoming with the uh, 350 or 400 million dollars that it would take to fix the dam. And I don't know how you're viewing Congress right now, but the fact of the matter is they don't seem to be real open with the purse strings right now. So, so federal funding is kind of uncertain. What the, the point is, we're not clear that that project could actually be implemented in the time frame that we need the additional water to be able to serve those future customers. The next option was the northern groundwater. Again, a series of large collector wells located on the southern shores of the Columbia River near Scappoose. Water would be taken out of the ground, pumped to a large treatment plant where not only would it be filtered, but we would also remove some of the minerals because the water generally looks an awful lot like Columbia River water, which is uh, more mineralized than Scoggins or the other sources for the region. So we would actually soften the water 
and then pump it over Cornelius Pass and bring it in not far from here, actually. The good news is it's a new source of supply. Unlike Scoggins, that's, that's an existing source. This would be an entirely new source of supply for the region. That would add redundancy, would really provide sort of a, a third leg to the supply stool, if you will, by having Portland, the Scoggins or uh, JWC system, and now this would be a third supply source. So it provides redundancy, which enhances reliability, but very hard to implement. There's a lot of uncertainties. There's a lot of permitting, pardon me, permitting challenges associated with this option. So it's, it's not clear that it would be in our long-term best interest. It also happens to be probably the most expensive option. The third option was the mid Willamette at Wilsonville. Um, it's very good water quality in terms of finished water quality. The city of Wilsonville has been using this supply for the last 10 years. The city of Sherwood's been using this supply for the last two years. Um, if you've had a Coke, bottled Coca-Cola product in the last 10 years, you've been drinking treated Willamette River water since the regional Coca-Cola bottling plant is in Wilsonville. A lot of people don't know that. So if you've been opposed to drinking the Willamette, you've probably already had it. Any Danzia water, it all came from the Willamette plant. Um, the other interesting feature of this particular option is we would be an owner in that source of supply. And so we'll compare that to Portland here in a minute, but, but we would be a key owner. We already, TBWD already owns some of the assets associated with that option. Ten years ago, we had invested in upsizing the intake and upsizing some of the raw water piping associated with that plant, and so we have some existing assets there, we just haven't been able to use them. Highly reliable supply, there's a lot more water goes past that particular point of diversion than we would ever be able to use. We already have a water right for that particular location, so that is secure. And again, this is an additional source of supply, so it adds redundancy, which enhances the reliability. There are some risks, there's some real challenges to building a pipeline as long as we're talking about. This would be a 20 mile long pipeline from Wilsonville into TBWD. So there's some challenges there, but they're doable. Last but not least, the fourth option was to purchase more water from Portland. The good news is this is the option that's probably fairly scalable. Right now we have one pipeline, we can time the addition of a future pipeline to be able to meet those demands. The contract has got a feature where we have to take a minimum purchase, but if we take more than that, we just pay for what we use. And so the good news is we could kind of increase that over time to be able to pay for what we use and minimize the initial capital investment and time that capital investment to when it's needed. It's a very sustainable solution. Uh, water flows all the way out to here by gravity from Bull Run when Bull Run is in operation. The challenge is that Bull Run isn't always in operation. When there's a large storm, there's a turbidity event, they have to shut down the Bull Run supply and then they pump water from a system not unlike the northern groundwater supply, series of wells on the south shore of the Columbia River that pump water all the way up to Powell Butte and then it flows by gravity into TVWD. The big challenge with the Portland option is that we don't own anything. We uh, we don't own the source of supply. We don't have any control over the decision making. So as we experienced recently with Portland's decisions on fluoridation of the water supply, we have no standing. Our obligation under the contract is that we will take water equivalent to what is Portland chooses to furnish to its retail customers. So we have no influence over Portland's decision. We had no influence over the fluoride decision. We have no influence over whether they would choose to add future treatment, but we have an obligation to pay for it regardless. And it's an existing source of supply, so it doesn't add redundancy. Clearly, cost is, is very important. There are a couple of ways to measure cost. Um, this graph reflects what we call the present value analysis. That's where you take, because each option has a different kind of cash flow associated with it. You have to spend capital money initially to build the option, and then you have to pay every year to be able to operate that. And the different options have different capital costs and different operating costs. 
And so through the miracle of economics, we're able to take all those cash flows and bring them back to a single number. And that's what this number reflects, is that present value in terms of what it would cost over many years to be able to build, operate, and maintain each of those options. In addition, that's just sort of the theoretical view of the cash flow. There's also how does it hit the pocketbooks, and so there's the rate impact. That's a separate analysis that we haven't presented here, but that's information that we have available. And then there's a risk perspective, because each of these are sort of um, conceptual options. We don't have final design documents on any of them at this point. And so we take a look at what we don't know about the options, and we fold that into uh, uh, what's called a, uh, a Monte Carlo simulation or an uncertainty analysis that allows us to look at, well, what are the range of potential costs? <coughs> And when we do that range of potential costs, we generally find that the numbers are a lot like this, but instead of a single point, it's a bell-shaped curve. And that bell-shaped curve for these options generally shows that the increasing water in Hague Lake, going with northern groundwater, or taking more water from the Portland option, all have about the same general cost. And we find that the mid Willamette option consistently has a lower cost as compared to those other three options. So that's really the, the set of options. That's how we've looked at the data so far. But clearly a big part of it is then hearing from folks like yourselves, members of the public. So over the last month, we've started a very aggressive outreach program to hear more from the community. Um, that effort's being led up by Todd Heiderkin of our staff, Todd. And, and so we have had, uh, right now we've had one open house. This is about the second major meeting that we've had with the community. We have another open house scheduled. We have a meeting scheduled with uh, the major businesses in the area. We're also uh, on call, available to you, if you, through your contacts and community groups, are interested in having a presentation that Todd would give, or Jim would give, um, you, or if you want me, I can understand why you wouldn't. Um, the fact of the matter is, I'm happy to come out as well and talk with your group, and, and what we really want to do is engage in the dialogue, hear from you in terms of your questions, your concerns related to what it is that we presented, and try to answer what we know and then share all of that information back with our board. The goal is that they would take all of this information, both the technical information as well as the community input, to then be able to make a decision on a future direction in April, uh, I believe it's actually now scheduled for April 24th at the TBWD board meeting. At that point, what that means is then we would essentially narrow our options. We're not eliminating any options, but we would then begin to really focus exclusively on that one preferred option going forward to be able to refine the cost, improve the engineering information behind each of those op the option that we prefer to go forward with. So that's that. We also have one more open house scheduled. I want to mention that. So on Saturday, March 2nd at TVWD's headquarters, um, at noon, so we tried to pick a time when people would be available that it wouldn't adversely impact the rest of your day. So we're available and would love to hear from you. Um, at that particular meeting, we'll have the opportunity to have more of our experts present. We'll have some additional graphics and demonstrations available to be able to share more details about each of those options. All, again, all with the goal of getting more input from the community. With that, it sort of wraps it up, and we're happy to hear from you. Uh, more than happy to stick around, answer questions, comments, concerns. Um, again, this is a time for questions. Um, when I scheduled this the programs this month, the, th the general thing was the growth in Washington County. We had the mayors at the first meeting, then we had the unincorporated folks. Now we have the water, and that's sort of the theme. Um, and again, I. I've heard Mark speak, so I think he can probably handle the questions and the things themselves. That's why I brought the whole crew. The whole thing. <laughs> you got back up here. Well, that's good. 
Um, so I'm going to sit down there and I'll let you handle each of the questions, introduce them. I, we can do this format where I repeat the question and bring you up here, or you can be here yourself. Uh, I'll just hang out up here. And Very good. I think you're capable of that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Emily Nuff. I'm a member. A couple of years ago, I spent time on Amargus Key on Belize, and then all of their water is supplied by underground cisterns and rain. We don't seem to have any underground cisterns, and we have a lot of rain. Why don't we use that as an option? We're extremely blessed in this part of the Northwest to have a lot of different options available to us. Um, most communities, you're absolutely right, we use surface water supplies, but the fact of the matter is there are several communities that do rely on groundwater. Um, there are smaller communities typically because it tends to be fairly costly. The good news is that it doesn't generally require a lot of additional treatment, so from that standpoint it's fairly predictable, but it, you do have to pump it out of the ground, then you have to pump it up to the pressure of the distribution system, and so from that standpoint the energy costs are fairly high. It all depends on the quality of the water and the availability of other options. Given the quantity of water that we need and the abundant sources that we have in terms of surface water supply, that generally is the most efficient solution. Chris Leslie, former member. I read where uh, you are planning a $300 million budget for improvements. Could you give us a breakdown on that? Um, the $300 million in terms of just the improvements or the district's capital program, I mean, the $300 million is not ringing a bell for me. And it was in one of your internet uh, okay forms. all right um, so the the 300 million that is being mentioned is largely the kind of the set aside that we've identified for future supply improvements and and right now it sort of depends on what option the district board adopts in terms of how we would spend that it turns out in some options it's probably not enough money um, in terms of the initial investment. So a very capital intensive option like the northern groundwater um, would be probably closer to 400 plus million dollars in terms of what TVWD's share would be. It all goes into the original source improvements and so if it were the Willamette option to pick on that one, we need to expand the treatment plant that's there and so we would have to add treatment capacity. That would be on the order of 100 to 150 million dollars. We have to build a pipeline. That's a very large pipeline. That pipeline is about 66, five and a half feet in diameter. So I could walk through it standing up. Um, it's a very large pipeline that's 20 miles long, goes all the way from Wilsonville up into the TVWD service area. That pipeline, our share could be on the order of 250 million dollars potentially. And so those are the big capital costs. Treatment, pipeline, a reservoir, maybe a pump station, and that's where the money goes to. Thank you. Patrick, we're the farm member. Um, two questions. One is, um, you talked about the big quake. What's the risk of the big quake to the current system that we have? And the second question was, um, I forgot the second question. Well, just stay there. I'll talk about the first one, and if you think of the second one, interrupt me. Um, so the, the subduction zone earthquake is a fascinating topic, and I, I have a whole other presentation that I'd be happy to share with the forum at some point if you're interested. Um, I happen to have the opportunity to serve on the uh, state commission that was developing a uh, water system response to how to prepare for the, uh, the subduction zone earthquake. If you think in terms of the probability of the subduction zone event, that's the piece that really drives the vulnerability in terms of risk. There is about a 37% chance that within the next 50 years we would have a subduction zone earthquake. Would it be magnitude 9? Might not be that big, but but there's a probability, based on Oregon State, Go Beavs' uh, latest analysis, that 
it's probably somewhere around 25 to 37 percent that such a big earthquake could occur within the next 50 years. So given that probability, if it occurred, what does it mean in terms of our existing water system? The work group that I was on looked at that very question and we've generated a nice thick report and the answer is it's not pretty. Um, the fact of the matter is it would take months for, pardon me, months for the region's water systems to begin to recover from such an event. We would be without our regular domestic supply for a long period of time. Right now we rely heavily on the Portland supply. Big portions of that system were uh, designed and constructed before there were ever any seismic standards in place. Um, the Joint Water Commission supply from Hag Lake, the, the dam we've talked about, it's particularly vulnerable, but even taking water out of the Tualatin River and running it through the treatment plant, the treatment plant was largely designed and constructed before there were standards for seismic improvements. And so there's particularly significant vulnerabilities and it's something that we're going to need to work on over time to make improvements. Second question was the political risk. You know, water wars have been a big problem in the West for a long time. So who owns the water and it said, we can get our supply here, we can get it there, but what are the political risks that we can actually get from the owners to let us have any water? Like sure. Portland and other. Okay. And, and uh, you know, I, uh, Commissioner Schmidt reminded me uh, a couple of weeks ago that the old adage is uh, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. Um, and the fact of the matter is that's, that's sort of at the heart of Patrick's question. The, the answer depends on which option. Each option is different. So under the Portland option, Portland has, the city of Portland has what's called a legislative water right for the water of the Bull Run supply. That's, an, that's a water right that's granted by the state legislature. In contrast, the water right that we have for the Willamette, TVWD actually has, uh, through the water, uh, Willamette River Water Coalition, has a water right for a uh, source of supply from the Willamette. That's granted by the State Department of Water Resources, and that's just kind of the typical water right, the way water rights are administered through the state. So just kind of quickly rattling through them, the Portland option, Portland might not be interested in giving up their source of supply, but the fact of the matter is they're very anxious to be able to generate the revenue that it has by having a large customer like TVWD. The revenue from TVWD helps buy down the Portland retail rates. That's just the simple answer of how that works. And given Portland's water rates, I'm sure they would probably not be very enthused about the prospect of having us go away. So, so I think they would likely be very interested in keeping TBWD as a customer for the long haul. Northern Groundwater has one of the largest uncertainties with that question, <clears throat> pardon me, largely because we don't have a water right for that source of supply right now. We'd have to secure that through the State Department of Water Resources. Um, the good news is there's an awful lot of water available on the Columbia River system and in that groundwater system but that would be a new water right and we'd have to start that process. Unclear how that would work out. That's one of those big uncertainties. The uh, mid Willamette option, the fact of the matter is, we, TBWD currently holds a water right that would be adequate to meet this demand. Um, so from that standpoint, we think we have that one covered. The Hague Lake system, the Scoggins Tualatin Basin Water Supply, um, through the Joint Water Commission, we have access to uh, water to meet our current demands. In addition, adding storage to the top of the dam, we would then secure a water storage right through state water resources that would allow us to then be able to use that extra stored water that's accumulated in the expanded dam. So it's a, it's a great question and it's very specific to each option. Uh oh, hard one. Uh, actually, probably not. Um, John Williams, board member. Um, Mark, thank you for being here. Uh, also, uh, we've been talking about uh, large volumes of water, I believe. Uh, I'm gonna talk about them a little smaller. Okay. Um, my sprinkling system. Uh, so um, I have a, I think I have to have a backflow 
Is that correct? That is correct. So, um, does that have to be monitored or adjusted? Sure. Can you speak a little bit about uh, about that, and then who takes care of it? Do I have to take care of it myself? Uh, how does that work? Sure. It's a great question. Thank you, John. Um, it's one of the challenges that we face. I, we talked about the importance of, um, of safe water supply. The fact of the matter is part of our job is to make sure that the water that's provided to you and our businesses and our community every day is safe. Part of that makes, is to make sure not only that the water we put into the pipes is safe, but that it stays safe until it comes out of your tap. One of the real challenges with having um, 60 plus thousand customers is that there's a lot of opportunities for a customer to have something go bad and have contamination on their property actually come back into our system. One of the real challenges is, for example, fire sprinkler systems. They have a lot of stagnant water in a fire sprinkler system. If the pressure goes down, water from that fire sprinkler system can actually flow backwards into the domestic system. The same thing is true with an irrigation system. If you have an auxiliary pump on your irrigation system, water can flow backwards into the domestic system. So part of the district's requirements are that you have a backflow device on your irrigation system so that that water can't come back into the domestic system. That backflow device is a specially designed device has to be tested every year by a certified tester. Those test results have to be submitted to the Tualatin Valley Water District, where we have basically a database, a computer record that we keep track of making sure that your device has been tested each year. If it hasn't, um, TVWD does a couple of things. First of all, we'll send you a reminder letter and ask you very politely. And if you don't honor that, then we will send you an additional reminder and ultimately, if you don't get your device tested, we will ultimately shut you off. We have developed, our board has implemented a new innovative program where rather than sending you a bunch of letters and being a thorn in your side, we actually have what's called the gold program. You can sign up in advance and we will just automatically every year come out and test your device at a bargain price uh, to be able to make sure that it gets done. In addition, if you don't want to be a part of that program, rather than shutting off your water, we will actually dispatch a contractor to come out and test the device scheduled with you as the homeowner to make sure it gets tested and then we will charge you, we'll add those costs to your water bill rather than making you arrange for getting a certified tester. So, long answer to a great question, is that what you were looking for? You bet. Thank you for coming today. Kathy Stanton, forum member. On the, the pages that you gave us, one of them talked about the ASR, and while you mentioned it, you didn't go into much depth. So my question is, does um, TPWD have one ASR and others in the planning stage? And maybe you might want to go into more detail, because while Emily Neff, forum member, talked about, asked about groundwater, ASR, while not actually groundwater, can act in the same way. Sure. Thank you. So aquifer storage and recovery in terms of water supply technology is relatively new. Um, about 10 years ago, the city of Beaverton, working with Tualatin Valley Water District, was one of the first water agencies in the Northwest to begin to tr try to apply this technology. Because again, you take finished water, treated filtered water, and run it back down a well, and then during the summer when the water demand is up, you pump that well. So you've stored the water in the aquifer during the winter and then pumped it out during the summer. There's a special license that we actually have to obtain from the State Department of Water Resources that regulates how much we can put down and how much we can take out, both in terms of rate and quantity. Um, but, but again, it is really surface water that's temporarily stored underground and then recovered. It turns out that it's uh, it's all about, it's, it's like real estate, it's location, location, location. The fact of the matter is, it doesn't work everywhere, and that's why it's relatively seldom used. It just so happens that 
that we're very fortunate in both the Beaverton TBWD service area as well as in Tigard, there's a set of formations uh, that are basalt columns basically, um, Cooper Mountain and Bull Mountain that have a particular geologic formation that allows the water to be stored. Um, it's really, I, I think of it in my simple mind as a layer cake. The fact of the matter is there's, there's sort of a, a basalt layer and then for many, many, you know, like hundreds of decades, there was no basalt flow, there was no volcanic activity, and you see a bunch of soil build up on top of that basalt layer. But then there's another volcanic eruption somewhere, and there'll be another basalt layer on top of that. And there could be three or four layers in the spectrum. And so you have basalt, and then there's an area called what's called an interflow zone between those basalt flows. And it's that interflow zone where we actually store the water, not in the basalt rock, but in the soil in between. And, and it really depends on the hydraulic characteristics of how much water you can store in that particular geologic formation. And it turns out that Cooper Mountain and Bull Mountain happen to have really good formations that accommodate a lot of water. Right now, TBWD has uh, one aquifer storage and recovery well. Beaverton has three, four. Um, and so Beaverton's obviously been a leader uh, in making that happen. Um, in addition, TBWD is looking at adding a second aquifer storage and recovery well. Um, we're also separate from that second TBWD ASR. We're working with the Joint Water Commission, mostly the city of Hillsborough and the city of Beaverton, to add at least one or two more aquifer storage recovery wells, all in this same geologic formation. At that point, we're going to need to assess just what the capacity of that formation is and how much the storage we have as well as how that fits within the long-term supply plan. Is that? Perfect. Uh, Sally Bunnell, forum member. Uh, how, oh, thinking about the Columbia, how would you deal with industri industrial waste um, that inadvertently gets in the Columbia? In, in Columbia? Like, like at the moment, there is there was a big, uh, in the upper Columbia, on the, on the Canadian border, industrial waste that came from the smelter um, ended up in uh, Cooley Dam. So, so how, how do you deal with the unexpected of that nature? Sure. So um, the northern groundwater option is particularly challenging because of that. Um, it's and and it's not even just the unexpected uh, contamination. The fact of the matter is, first of all, it's a it's a more challenging water to work with because it is more mineralized. But in addition, uh, we know that, for example, this particular location of Scappoose is just downstream of the Portland Harbor. The Portland Harbor is the site of several Superfund sites, uh, extensive contamination over the years. Now the good news is it's being cleaned up. The fact of the matter is it's going to take years to be able to complete that. One of the other concerns that frequently gets brought up is what about Hanford? Um, you know, will that slowly over time leak uh, radioactive contaminants into the Columbia River that would potentially contaminate that source? We don't know. And so one of the things that we've done in the planning of this option is to be very conservative in terms of how we approach the, the treatment requirements. And so we have a very sophisticated treatment system that we've assumed to be able to be able to remove a lot of those kinds of contaminants. The other good news is that it's different. It's not like it's taking water directly out of the Columbia River. And so by taking water from the groundwater that is fed by the Columbia River, there's some bank filtration that occurs. And so there's some natural removal of some of the contaminants. Is it a perfect solution? Absolutely not. It's not going to remove all of the contaminants. And, and again, the real challenge here is mostly we don't know exactly what all we're going to get. In the event there was a large earthquake, for example, a lot of the fuel that's stored in the Portland area is stored on the west side of the Willamette River just across from Swan Island in a particularly vulnerable formation. It would likely slide right into the Willamette River and all of those contaminants would then wash downstream down the Columbia River. So there's a lot of bad things that can happen, but we've tried to be conservative in terms of how we plan and, 
and conceive of this option to be able to minimize those risks. Wayne Potter, member. I, uh, we all experience problems with contaminated water from the Portland supply, and in Tigard we were cut off for several days. I would be curious about how that affected your system, and how do you think it will affect it in the future? So I should, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, I, I should explain uh, part of my background that Commissioner Williams graciously did not go into is I was the uh, director of water quality for many years at the Portland Water Bureau and went on to become the director of operations and maintenance for the Water Bureau. So I'm sort of familiar with their system and some of the challenges that they face. Um, in the particular events that we've had over the last couple of years, uh, boil water events related to Portland supply, they've generally been traced back to open reservoirs. The good news is TVWD's part of the system doesn't get water that has gone through Portland's open reservoirs. We take water from, uh, it generally coming from Bull Run, goes to Powell Butte. From Powell Butte, which is a covered reservoir, it flows by an enclosed pipeline all the way across the Willamette into our service area. So we're able to avoid a lot of those challenges associated with Portland's open reservoirs. That said, some of our, we, we do uh, contract operations for a couple of different customers, one of which is Valley View Water District. Valley View gets water directly from the Portland system that has gone through the particular reservoir that had a problem. So our staff has had a lot of experience in dealing with the fallout associated with the boil water event and being able to provide those notices. It's a particularly challenging set of issues because, again, First of all, the question is, is the water safe to drink? Well, no, we wouldn't have told you to boil it if it hadn't been. But in addition, there's, there's issues with things like customer safety. It's not a particularly safe thing to boil water. There's a lot of danger associated with scalding and, and people pulling pans over onto themselves. So there's, there's just a residential safety issue. And then, you know, last but not least, it really raises questions in terms of the customer's confidence in the product that we provide. The good news is all of the options that we're looking at are all built around enclosed sources of supply following current design standards would not have the kind of challenges in terms of open reservoirs. Does that mean we'll never have a boil water event? Well, we're going to do our best to be able to avoid that. Um, sometimes things happen that are beyond our control. Um, obviously, after a, a large earthquake, there's a high probability that there would be a massive regional boil water order. But, but the systems that we're talking about would all be designed to avoid that risk. Thank you very much, Mark Fraber, for a member. Cost of regulation at all levels of government, how much does that figure in, uh, and what type of challenges do you face? The, you know, the, the regulations have continued to become more stringent over time. Obviously, if we were planning and designing these kinds of improvements, even 20 years ago, we probably would have used different technology than what we're talking about now. One of the challenges is there's still a lot of things that we don't know. Any of these sources are subject to contamination potentially at very, very low levels. And so it's really not even the regulatory challenge nearly as much as the technology challenge of now being able to measure things that we didn't even know about five years ago. But the good news is now we can measure them at the parts per trillion level. So what does it mean if there's a part per trillion of uh, ibuprofen in your drinking water that we didn't know about for the last 30 years but has always been there? And it's at a part per trillion. Um, a couple of years ago I shared with our board an example that um, at those kinds of levels, you'd have to drink the equivalent of 50 lifetimes worth of drinking water to get the exposure equivalent to one ibuprofen tablet. What's the public health significance of those very low levels of exposure that, frankly, we just haven't known about? So that's one of the challenges we're looking at. The good news is that the particular options in terms of treatment technology that we're talking about using 
are considered best available technology for removing those kinds of contaminants. And so we've again tried to be fairly conservative in how we approach it to be able to minimize those risks in the future. Thanks. I know it won't help my headache. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, it won't. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mark. We're not done. We're just done with the television portion of this thing. So there'll be more questions asked. And, uh, I've been less indulgent than self-indulgent than some of the other presidents, but I want to take this opportunity to thank um, Kathy Stanton, um, Ann Madden, um, Wayne Potter, and Pat Mayberry uh, for a newly created um, program committee. Uh, I'm responsible for some of the recent programs. Sig was responsible for a lot of the campaign programs, along with um, our uh, erstwhile um, televisor, Eric Squires. And Eric does an amazing job here. Eric has allowed us to maintain the same presence on the um, cable and, and uh, on the internet, in fact, enhanced internet, as we had uh, when we were paying TVCC for it. And Gary Olson has maintained the website and has done a lot of things to keep us visible. And Ann Madden does the press releases. A whole bunch of folks we've had to go back to um, to ask for things. You know, um, oh, John Hustler on the program for me, too. I'm sorry. Uh, we've had a lot of folks who, um, step forward talk to the board to help us out and I would just say that we've um, making a lot of progress on some of the issues that have been discussed with with me and the board so we're trying to um, make sure the public affairs forum retains its role you know, of disseminating information and we don't make any money from it no one's paid um, and to my extent the last decades I've been associated with no one's embezzled significant amounts of money either so uh, so we're trying to do good without any direct benefit. I don't know how many political careers have been launched from this um, vantage point. My, my suspicions are not many. So this is this is kind of unique because a whole bunch of folks are getting together to inform themselves and to access information to help everyone else access that information. So uh, it's it's kind of unique and the, 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 the longevity of this. The Portland City Club has paid staff and um, and has a base of donors in the law firms and, and, and the other firms downtown, which help it sustain itself. And the mayor of Portland now is an employee of the Portland City Club, I think as executive director. We've done this since 1956 on a volunteer basis. And we've asked volunteers to put their time in. We've asked speakers to come here and present the issues. And we've been a forum in the greatest sense of the word, a forum in the sense of basically going out and selflessly expanding the public's no right to know things. The newspapers have kind of taken a step back for the finances. Even the um, television stations have taken a step back. And you know, you have guerrilla news type organizations, the blogs and things of that nature. But authoritative sources of information subject to questions with informed individuals asking them without particular bias or motive, those types of things are few and now somewhat far between. We have candidates doing their own uh, outreach and very few places do you have folks without a partisan slant to things offering these things. And you don't have to pay a thousand or ten thousand to be a member of the forum like some of the other um, forums that are out there. So it's unique. Whether we can sustain it or not uh, because is going to be an issue because apparently it's a generation skipping thing. Most of the folks are um, boomers or older who are in our organization now. But as long as we can, we're going to try to present this in a fair manner. And I consider it my um, duty to expend my efforts for as long as I can uh, because I joined in 1982 when Eldon Foster was president. And I remember my father speaking of it. And, um, we're going to maintain it. We're going to keep this thing going. It's going to be vital. It's going to be important. The mo modes of communication with the general public may change and evolve. But I would thank everyone for their efforts at helping us and being informed. And now, I think the television is going to go off here within a moment or two. So the Washington County Public Affairs Forum is a public service entity created to air different views of folks. We are um, on the internet. We are on the um, cable. And if you has an idea or, or something else, I'd be willing to take the phone call. I may not be very receptive to the message, but at least talk. And so again, thank you. And we're going off the air. And Chris Leslie has a question. And anyone else has questions, I think uh, Mark Newton will stick around to answer them. And Marilyn Williams and the other board members, thank you for your service. And we're um, signing off. Thank you.
<laughs> Mr. Knudsen, thank you for coming here. This is an honor. Thank you. It's my the, honor. Well, my question, uh, again, from your uh, only source, TVC TV, the Order District, uh, you, I believe, have 15 scientific projects that are scientifically credible. Those were your own words. I don't know what makes scientific credible. But would you explain about those projects? Maybe uh, they'd be of interest to us. I'm drawing a blank in terms of which projects we're talking about. Um, they said they were scientifically credible. credible. Yeah, well, I'm sure they were. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the context? Related to water supply or some of our capital projects and capital improvements? I'm sort of drawing a blank, but I think your capital is... Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> there are, uh, the, the district is doing a lot of different work uh, in addition to water supply, in part to be able to continue to achieve the objectives that we've talked about in terms of safe, reliable, abundant water supply now and into the future. And so some of those improvements um, obviously involve tearing up streets, unfortunately, to be able to install new mains. And so we have probably a dozen different projects that are main improvement projects. We frequently work with uh, uh, Washington County when they are making street upgrades. And so the Bethany Boulevard project that's going on now, we actually are replacing about a mile of pipeline as part of that project. And this is all just part of ongoing upgrades. One of the things that we've done in terms of scientific credibility is we've actually changed our design standards over the last year uh, to be able to improve the seismic resiliency of those pipelines. It used to be that we, a project like that, would put together a pipe and the, the pipe joints literally slide together. Um, and you just stab them together and then move on to the next ones. Now we've gone to, it frankly is more costly, but each joint is essentially bolted together in a way that it's restrained so that if you remove one piece of pipe, it doesn't come apart. And so it's to improve the seismic reliability. As the pipes shake in the earthquake, they won't just shake apart. That's, that's the goal of one of the things that we're trying to do. Another big set of improvements that we're making is to be able to upgrade the pumping capacity. We serve essentially the entire western flank of the Portland West Hills on this side. And, and one of the challenges in water supply is to be able to get water to those elevated areas. I don't know if you noticed, but water's kind of heavy, and particularly when you're moving millions of gallons at a time, you have to have a lot of pumps to be able to push the water up to those reservoirs, up to those hills. And so one of the things that we are doing is upgrading the pump stations. We've added a new pump station on Thompson Road um, that will be able to pump water up to the West Hills. And, and in doing that, we not only improve the seismic reliability, but we're also then improving the energy efficiency by adding technology that wasn't available even 20 years ago to be able to reduce our long-term operating costs as well as improving the reliability. So those are the kinds of areas that we're really focusing on to be able to meet our customers' demands into the future concurrent with doing all this work. I read where they have a plant now that will be an egg substitute. I wonder if you have a plant for a water substitute. <laughs> <laughs> I never, this will be the first question I've asked. Uh, when I was in uh, elementary school, we studied Oregon history. I was in a Catholic school, they had a textbook. And the history didn't go back very far. And later my father was on the lens, was a hearings officer for LCDC. And I recognized why, because most of the history of the Pacific Northwest, because of the, of the um, fault off there, was obliterated um, about, uh, about, I think, 50 years before the Revolutionary War. Yeah, about almost, 1700. You know, there's essentially no record of human habitation in almost any form prior to that. And apparently that's um, happened cyclically in 300, 350 year intervals. Um, it would seem that given the time frame of the last one and the consistency of the occurrences of these things, that the whole area would be more 
focused on the, on the, on the essentially um, ephemeral nature of human civilization in the Pacific Northwest, that we can move more organized to it. You have a background of serving on the earthquake uh, issues before. What things are we generally doing? It's outside the scope a little bit of this, but since sure. you did that, and I want to ask you, what generally is government doing and to prepare for this? So in the 2011 legislature, um, there was a bill that came forward, HR 3, that actually charged the Oregon Seismic Safety Policy Advisory Council to prepare a thing called the Oregon Resiliency Plan that really looked exactly at that very question in terms of what things should we do to be able to improve our preparedness and decrease our risks over the long haul, recognizing that it could take decades to be able to adequately address this concern. Um, we were given under that particular bill a very specific direction in terms of it would be a magnitude nine event, that it would have a 500 year recurrence interval. And we were broken down into nine different subject areas that looked at things like transportation, businesses, buildings at risk, um, what else? Uh, structures, banking, industrial communications. In, in, industrial uh, uh, events, uh, business, communications was a big area. and. Not the least of which, my obvious area was the water and wastewater work group. And, and it specifically included both water and wastewater, since they clearly go hand in glove in terms of public safety and uh, public health of our community. Um, in terms of, of the water systems, obviously I mentioned earlier, we need to do a lot of things. One of the things that we're thinking this particular supply improvement project does is gives us the opportunity to provide a new source of supply that's designed specifically for these requirements. Um, for example, the Portland system, it will take them decades to be able to address these improvements, um, to be able to harden the pipelines that come all the way from the Bull Run we would be able to build a new source of supply built to the current seismic standards. Some of the other challenges that exist in terms of regions, things like schools. Um, Commissioner Doan served on the OSPAC for a long time. And, and there are how many unreinforced school buildings in Oregon? I believe there's 860 that have extreme collapse potential. 860 schools that have an extreme collapse potential. As a community, I, it's hard for me to understand why we wouldn't make that one of the highest priorities that we have to be able to begin the process of reinforcing them. The state has actually identified that as a priority and has slowly started making improvements and, and those improvements I believe only take about 100 years to be able to complete. It's a really long cycle that is just not adequate to meet the, the likely return interval of this event. Um, other big challenges are transportation. Um, I sat in several work group meetings with uh, the guy from transportation who's sort of my counterpart, and, and it's pretty scary. One of the, you know, we talk about we'll have a lot of main breaks and we could have literally years worth of work in terms of fixing main breaks if we have access to those locations and if we have access to things like the equipment, the labor, the materials that are needed to fix it. Because we're so dependent on the transportation network, just getting our people to those locations and getting the equipment and getting the necessary materials to be able to do those fixes will be particularly challenging. Energy is another major sector that's gonna be particularly heavily impacted. I mentioned the whole fuel storage facility on the, uh, in the lower Willamette Basin. That facility is really the region's regional fuel depot. If that were to slide into the river, which it's particularly prone to do, um, the, the next solution is literally trucking all of our fuel in from Boise, um, which will mean that fuel will be a very tight commodity for months, if not years, after this particular event. So, so um, we've put together our report other sectors have put together their reports. This is all slated to go to the state legislature this year, uh, February, 
And so probably end of February or early March, you're going to hear a lot more about this. And you heard it here first. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, we're not recording, so... Uh, yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Knudsen. Thank you for the Twelve Mountain Valley uh, Water District, and thank you for the um, presentation. Again, thank you for your attention. I guess this is where we formally sign off. Um, I had a joke, uh, but I won't tell it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.